Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to my channel, Runaway Slave. I would like to give a big up to all my subs and supporters who like, comment, and share the videos. In addition, a special big up to all those who purchased my masterpiece, my book, The N Word Is No Secret in the Service. Big up to you all. Let's cook. Okay, people. First, big shout out to the loyal sub, Khadija for inspiring this video right here. And we're gonna talk about the brother Dal Mabil. Dal Mabil, he's a 33 year old Sudanese black man who went missing in Jackson, Mississippi. Now Dal Mabil, he was very beloved in the Jackson community. They say he worked with the youth, particularly he worked with children who played soccer because he was a gifted soccer player himself. Now Dal Mabil, he escaped war torn Sudan. And when he left Sudan, he built a new life in Mississippi. He went to high school. He went to school. Again, he was a gifted soccer player. After that, he went to college, got his associate's degree, and he had recently been working as a manager at a Jackson restaurant, and he planned on returning to school at Jackson State to earn a degree in computer science. Uh, Dalmabil also had a son, and he had a white wife named Carissa Bowley. Now, I'm not sure if Carissa Bowley is the mother of his son, I don't think so, but correct me if I'm wrong, get in the comments. But Dalma Bill does have a family who cares about him, a real family, his black family, his Sudanese family. And he also has a black um, biological mother who's very concerned about him. She's in America. No, I believe she's still she's still in a refugee camp. He has a brother named, by the name of Bull Mobile. And he also has a foster mother, African-American woman named Valina Greer, who really cares about him as well, and they want to know what happened. His uh, foster mother, Valina Greer, said that Dalma Bill is everything you could hope for a son. So we have to find out what happened to Dalma Bill, okay? And from what I gather and many other people gather from the story so far, Dalma Bill's black Sudanese family, his African-American foster mother, and his legal team are helping out and looking for uh, what happened to him. And they're all looking at his white wife some kind of way. And it only makes sense. It only makes sense as to why they're looking at her side eye. Now, according to his wife, Carissa Bowley, she said that Dalma Bill went missing in broad daylight on March 25th after going for a walk on a trail connecting the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum with other city landmarks. So this is a trail that's not far from the house that connects uh, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum with other city landmarks. It's a trail that you can walk on. She said that Dalma Bill left the house around 1230 in the afternoon, went for a walk. He left his cell phone behind. She said it's not unusual for him to leave his phone home on the charger or whatever. And he went out for this walk on this trail. After he went out that day, he was never seen again. I'm angry. I'm hurt, and I'm tired, but I won't give up, because Dow was too precious to me to give up on him. So when he didn't return home that day, his wife Carissa Bowley filed a missing persons report that night at 8.30 p.m. So after that, his wife Carissa Bowley and other members of the community went out looking for him to no avail. They're out there, they're looking for him, okay? Finally, a body was found on April 13th in the Pearl River in Lawrence County, which was identified as Dalma Bill, based on a preliminary autopsy. Of course, police say no foul play. That's what they always say. So that what they're basically saying is Dalma Bill went out in Jackson, Mississippi on March 25th at around 1230 in broad daylight and just decided to jump in a river or jump in a body of water and commit suicide, done, that's it. They're saying, take that answer, wrap it up, okay? And that's what they always say, right, y'all? Now, Dalma Bill has a brother, and his brother is up on it. His brother, he's up on it, and I like how he's moving in this situation. His brother does not believe the story at all. His foster mother does not believe it, and his legal team, they do not believe it. Basically, it's very obvious that they do not trust his wife. He also finished high school here 
and he went to community college and graduated with an associate degree in computer networking. He was good in everything he does. Even his plan, he was actually planning to uh, go back to school uh, at Jackson State uh, to complete his uh, computer science degree. That was his plan for this year. And uh, now uh, my brother has been reported missing uh, for the last uh, three weeks. Uh, it has been a devastating news in my family. Uh, when I hear that uh, my brother went missing, um, I didn't receive a call on March 25th when he went missing. I only received a call on March 26th by one of our friends who is a Sudanese who also lives here, John Dibble, and he's here with me today. Uh, if John would have not called me, I would have not known the, the disappearance of my brother. So when John called, I came immediately to Jackson, Mississippi to find out what had happened to my brother because I knew um, my brother was married and all I have seen when he got married, they, he does everything with his wife, including going for a walk. So it was very strange that Da was reported missing and that way Da went for a walk by himself. He normally walked with his wife. But this time, I was told that Da went for a walk uh, by himself and went missing. So I came to Jackson and to find out what could have caused it. I did my little investigation and I came up with uh, some issues that may have uh, led to his uh, disappearance. And those are the things that I have been trying to put the Capitol Police and Jackson Police Department to work together uh, to try to look into all these uh, issues that were underlying uh, the cause of his disappearance. I know that there was a body that was found in the Poor River and I believe that body is the body of my brother Dow. I know some people want to deny that, but that is a body of my brother. So you heard his brother. He usually goes everywhere with his wife. He usually goes everywhere. And I do think that part right there is part of Dow Mobile being oppressed by a white person. But that's a whole nother topic. But uh, so this day that he goes out without his wife, he goes out on his own. He disappears. Then when he disappears, his wife never calls his brother. Never calls his big brother. His big brother has to find out from somebody else in the Sudanese community, you know, that his brother's just missing. Why didn't she call? So she's already a suspect, you know. And this is what his wife said to the media. These were her words, people. These are his wife's actual words that they put out that she said. 25 minutes after he left home, he was taking his completely predictable normal walk. He was at a normal pace. He was in a normal state of mind. I know that if he could beat home, he would be home. He just didn't disappear. I just really want to follow up with what happened, and I need people to all be together and following up with what happened. So you all heard that. That's what she said. So one thing she knows is she knows what time he left because he left a message for her or whatever. And then... You said he was taking his predictable normal walk. And she said that he was at a normal pace. For me to know somebody's at a normal pace and that I'm taking my predictable normal walk. Don't it mean that you have to see them? Like, I don't know what pace you work walking at. If you tell me, hey, listen, I'm about to walk to your house from such and such. How am I going to know you at a normal pace? You could be walking slow, listening to your, your iPod, I don't know, or you could be walking fast because there's a dog behind you. I don't know. How does she know? You ha this is something you have to see. And if he didn't have the phone, he didn't call her and say, hey, I'm out here. Yeah, I'm at my normal pace. How do you know that he's at his normal pace? Means you have to see what speed he's walking at. And you said that he was in his normal state of mind. Okay. Maybe that's what you, you're taking that from how he was when he was at the house. Then she said that he just didn't disappear. How you know? Okay, so if he just didn't disappear, who you think got him? What, what you think happened? 
if if I say that somebody just didn't disappear, believe it, I'm running my mouth and saying what I might have think happened. And at first, when it's emotional like this, I'm coming up with everything until, you know, people calm down. Then they start thinking, OK, at first you're going off on everything, you know. But the things that she named, that she said, these are her words, are things that you have to see with your eyes. I'm walking at a normal pace. I'm taking my same normal walk. So where did he, where he at then? If you seen him doing this, so what he just boop, went, you know, went into the thin air. I've heard all kind of excuses from these people before. So where you think he at then, Carissa Bowley, the wife? You know what I mean? This is what she said. Also. When Dow didn't come home at 8.30 that evening, Carissa Bowley went and filed a missing persons report with the Capitol Police Department. Okay, that makes sense. But the brother said, and I don't think he's lying, she didn't even call me. Why didn't you call his brother? He had to hear it from somebody else in the Sudanese community the next morning around 6 a.m. that his brother was missing. You know this is all he got. Why didn't you call his brother? Then they finally, they find Dalma Bell's body floating in a river. And of, of course, the police say no foul play. They do a first autopsy. They say no signs of foul play. But you know how that goes, people. There's never any signs of foul play when they have a black, a black body floating in a river or hanging in a tree or by a shoestring somewhere or their own belt. A belt that they don't even own type stuff. And then you already know when the white folks start talking, anything that could have happened becomes a possibility. You know, you ever notice that when them white supremacists leave different comments and things like that? Also, you know, on social media or posts or in response to articles, you know, and some of you Negroes, too. You know, some of you Negroes, too, because you're scared. And they just start anything's a possibility. Oh, they went into the vortex type stuff. Oh, well, a Bigfoot could have all kind of stuff. Listen here. This is the Lawrence County Sheriff. His name is. Ryan Hoss Everett. Yeah, people, his name is Hoss. They call, it, they call him Hoss. This is what he said. At the rate the river was flowing, he could, have not, he, he could have nine miles an hour. He could have been floating nine miles an hour at that rate. He could have floated just about the Bogalusa, Louisiana, from Jackson. Okay, so what he's saying is he could have went from Jackson, Mississippi, to Bogalusa, Louisiana in a 24 hour period because of the way that the river was flowing. That's what he's saying. Then he says, there's a lot of different things that could have happened. He could have had a heart attack and fallen into the river. For all we know, I mean, nobody knows right now. This is what the white sheriff, Ryan Hoss Everett is saying. You notice he said what could have happened, you know, but you notice when these people, when they start talking about what could have happened, they will never say that some white cracker groups or a club or some some clans, uh, some 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 clan club or whatever could have got him and took him away. White people will never say that. And if they thinking that they don't go into the media and say it, they never say that because usually people like this guy, Hoss, Ryan Hoss, the sheriff, they usually belong to these groups. Also, they typically they usually do belong to these groups also. And it also notice that these white supremacists like sheriff and everybody else. They come up with every possibility as to what could happen. A dog could have pushed the person. Or, or you, he might have fell into this, a, a sinkhole, anything. But you notice his white wife, I don't know if anybody following this or looked into it, his white wife never says, never says what everybody's thinking, a black person. Well, one of you racist white supremacist crackers, one of y'all might have did this to him and got him and, and, and wrapped him up and did something to him. But her people, they always use their imagination. You notice that? But you'll never hear her come out and say that. They don't say that. And a wife, I think, should be saying that from the jump. You're a white woman in Mississippi. You try to act like you are. We, we, we love the world. We are the world type stuff. Well, you ain't no racist, right? You ain't a white supremacist. But people, but his brother, Bull, is on to them. His legal team is on to them. 
And what his legal team, what him, what him and his legal team did was they filed emergency legal papers to ensure that his brother's body wouldn't be released to his white wife, Carissa Bally, and her family until an autopsy was performed by both the state crime lab and an independent medical examiner. The Hens County uh, judge named Dwayne Thomas did grant this request, pausing the release of the body and ordering a second autopsy. Okay, so they don't want the wife, Carissa Bowley, and her family to just go get his body and cremate him and do whatever they want to do. They're like, nah, we need to put this order in because we got to really find out what happened. We got to bring somebody outside of the state of Mississippi in here and see. Why, why is this? Why is Carissa Bowley even thinking to move this fat, they must have got a hunch like, yo, she's going to do this. Let's stop her from doing that. You know what I mean? But then after that, after that, Carissa Bally, the wife, being the wife and her attorney, they went and filed. And they went and filed also in response to that and said that her attorney said that her 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 client, who is Carissa Bally, embraces the judge order for an additional autopsy with the condition it be conducted only after all law enforcement entities finish investigating. Okay, my thing is, if you embrace this judge's order that his family went and got, you're feeling some kind of way. She's feeling some kind of way because they did this without her. But there's a reason why they did this without her. Why did you, why do you feel like you have to go and file anything? Why, why would you? She said that she's okay with this being his wife. She went and bought all her documentation to prove that she is her, his legal wife. And she said that I approve of this with the condition that it be conducted only after all law enforcement entities have finished investigating. But my, my question to that is why though? What is your point in that? I can't think of one point to her saying that, you know, I want this to go down like that. I mean, it's not like they're going to go back and touch his body. They already did their part. The state already said no foul play. They did what they did. I think this is just her trying to be a white dictator and uh, following the orders of some people who need things to happen like that for some reason that I don't know. Ross, you said you believe that this is where Dow fought for his life. What, what, can you talk to us about what you think may have happened in this area and, and also what the brother said, why the wife wasn't with him as they normally went walking on the trail together? I have not spoken to the wife, so I cannot account for why she was not present that day. But by all accounts, it would be very unusual for Dow to go out on a walk uh, by himself. He generally walks with his wife, and we have uh, evidence that we can't uh, share at this time that puts Dow on this trail. And uh, we've seen some of the pictures of Dow's, what we believe is Dow's body. And... Uh, the body uh, had met physical harm. And we, were, we believe that it was brought on by others. And there, there is a video, you know, that showed uh, some people putting what we believe to be a body into a vehicle. There were cars passing along this uh, street right here. And when you go around that curve, there were cars that were, that passed that truck that was back in. And uh, we believe that somebody driving along the street that day saw something suspicious, didn't know what it was, and kept going. So that's why we decided today to come to the trail, hoping that this would trigger the memory of those individuals who were driving along this pathway that day. Uh, Any time between 1.45 and, and, and 2, and 2 o'clock that day, and maybe perhaps later. Uh, certainly, you know, afternoon. afternoon. And, and certainly it's very concerning that someone goes out for an afternoon walk and comes up missing, supposedly, in broad daylight. Uh, as you can see, this trail is very open compared to some walking trails here in Mississippi that are more secluded. But this one, we believe that people, someone had to have seen something. And if they did, we want them to call the F. So people, they have some proof. They have video. They know something's up. And they don't trust this white wife, Carissa Bowley, at all. Neither do I. I wouldn't. You know what I'm saying? She's just exhibiting all 
you know, the fact that she just ain't right. Now, here's what I got to add to this. I always tell people on this channel that Africans or any black people in the world, you know, who aren't from America, you have the right to do what you want with your life. I feel as though you should be able to go anywhere uh, you want to go, just like anybody should be able to go where they want to go. But you got to understand, Africans, people from Africa, the whole continent. I know Africa is a continent and has many countries, but I'm talking about the whole continent. OK. And anybody that's from some kind of island somewhere that is not American black people. Listen, when you go to America, you are food for these white supremacists because you are easier to get. We've been living with them. We know how sinister they can be. So we watch certain things. We have a history. And even with our history and all the stuff that we know, as you can see, they still even tearing us up. Because we want to be hard headed and ignorant, you know, and act like we can't, you know, respect our history and the people who came before us and things like that. They still tearing black Americans up who don't get it. So imagine what they're going to do to you. OK, it's easier to get you all. You all are more food to them because in their minds, what these white people were saying is any black body will do. We don't care what it is. A nigga is a nigga to us. Any black body will do. You know what I mean? Mississippi. And they know that you're going to embrace them more because you often think you have this thing in his head with your head. A lot of you where you believe that they saved you. You know what I mean? All oh, these white people did that. They're all they're good. They saved us. And this is America, you know, but you got to understand, people. These are the cousins of the people that chased you out of your own country and sucked up all your own resources and left you hungry and through some kind of dictating coon that you got over there and did all that. They're the same people. They're the reason why you don't have anything and you left in the first place. They don't like you. And they start these little programs up or these little organizations to bring like war, uh, you know, boys from war stricken countries like Sudan or Sierra Leone or wherever else. They bring that there only to satisfy their guilt. For all the stuff that they do to black people in America. It's like, oh, we know we do this. So let's do this for some black people. It's a good thing. You know what I mean? Nobody likes you, man. Nobody likes you. You know what I mean? Understand that. No, understand that they don't like you at all. And you shouldn't like them. The big brother, Mo, uh, a bullmobile, this is what he said. He said, I can't believe this will happen to someone who came here from a war-torn country. I was expecting much better government in this country. But this is the way the United States operates. It is so appalling. OK, you get it now. Bullmobile, this didn't have to happen for you to get it. This didn't have your brother didn't have to get found floating in the water for you to understand that. Study the history of black people in America. And we've been trying to tell you. But even if we don't tell you, go study the history. Just don't go walking around. You know what I mean? Thinking you in some great place. But Boomer Bill, shout out to you. I like the way you moving as far as getting with, uh, you know, some black people, the, the attorney, Carlos Tanner. And you looking at this white woman side eye because I think you already felt some kind of way about her from the jump. And, you know. And, you know, they're hoping that they get this independent autopsy done It's probably done already, you know. But once these people have a body. I've learned that they can do whatever they want to do to it. They can alter some things and change some. They can do that. Carlos Tanner, one of his attorneys, one of Bull Mobile's attorneys said that his client was being left in the dark about the suspicious circumstances about his brother's disappearance and death. OK. And listen, man, you've seen all those white people out there looking and helping. Now, do all those white people in that community know? No, they don't know. But do some of them know? Yes, they do. Yes, some of those white people out there who are looking are even related to some of these organizations and people who have been doing this to black people in Mississippi for years. They're not going to sell their people out. You know what I mean? They're not going to sell their people out. And you notice his white wife, she's not wilding out, yelling and accusing, I mean, and accusing none of her people of doing this. She's staying with them full pale Voltron. She's on point. She knows what to do. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to get too deep into her because this would make this video too long, too long. But you see what this woman is acting like. She's all acting like some kind of you can go through her social. She's acting like some kind of hippie. She's all about love and peace. 
and a lot of these white chicks who look like her, they do that type of stuff. But it's usually never sincere. It's all about control. Quite often, these women are racist and white supremacists, and it's all about control, having somebody for themselves that they could bring in to act like a little puppet and fit into their little, you know, world, their little hippie world. Because, you know, black people are welcoming. They go to their country and things like that. OK, come on or whatever. Some of us, you know, some people in those countries just love the white man so much. Some of us just love the white man so much. So welcoming, you know, and then she went to the the lowest, you know what I mean? She got the weakest link here. She went and got the weakest link. Somebody from a war-torn country who probably already, even though he does have a black adopted mother, who know? I don't know how his mind operated, people. But I don't think people like her really care about these people from these other countries and stuff like that. Because if you really cared about him as a white woman, if you cared about these black men from Sudan, like Dharma, Bill, and others, you help him bring him a, a, a Sudanese woman here for him to be with. If you really cared about him, that's what you would do. But you, no, you cursing him with your whiteness. He got to wake up with you, dog hairs, all, you know, all kind of no soap. You know that all stuff, waking up with a, a shepherd dog all in the bed, a Labrador, all that old nasty stuff. You know what I'm saying? No food in the house. You wouldn't do that to him, yo. You would say, oh, I really like and care about you. Like his, like his foster mother would probably do. And I like you people. Let me try to get you somebody here who looks like you. In a way. No, you don't do that because it's all about you. It's all about these women. Yo, people, these, these, these women like her, these hippie type white women, they not so nice. Don't get it twisted. You know what I mean? And then they do the control thing where you start to play on his, you know, talking, oh, well, I, I got to have the dog in the bed and all this other stuff or it's for my anxiety and my sobriety and all this other white. You know what they be doing. And I know this because black men in America go through this. African-American men who do that. Y'all know it. Talk to them. Talk to them. Oh, you, they got a Labrador and a shepherd. You know, dog hairs, all that. Come on, man. Y'all know what I mean. But anyway, but. I know what you're saying, and you are right. Ultimately, Dama Bill had to agree with this. He had to agree to lay up with this woman and be with her. You're right. You're right. I'm just saying, man. Yo, I hope that they take this lesson back to the old country and amongst the community so they can know, like, listen, it ain't so great. Being around these people ain't so great. Anyway, people, get in the comments. Let me know what you think about this, but... First, I got to say condolences to the family of Dalma Bill. My bad, I forgot. To his brother, his mother, his family, his foster mother, and anybody that cared about him and loved him. Condolences to you all. People get in the comments. Let me know what you think about this. Easy.